Okay, so it's my pleasure to um, introduce our keynote speaker, and uh, he's very local, um, Terry Sinofsky, here at the Salk Institute, as well as uh, UC San Diego. And I must say, I cannot think of any more appropriate uh, speaker uh, in several dimensions here. So first of all, this is an e, uh, is a EMBS uh, event, Engineering, Medicine, and Biology. There are very few people in the world, well, they're very, it's, it's hard to, so few people have uh, National Academy status, but even fewer people that have triple National Academy status in engineering, science, and, 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 uh, and medicine. So Terry is one of them. Um, also, in terms of computational neuroscience, I don't know any lab or any uh, researcher in the field of computational neuroscience who hasn't one time in, 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 during their careers have spent time at the uh, computational neuroscience lab here at the SOC, uh, right? Um, and Terry also has a vision that really spans very broadly and, and is also very nicely resonating with, with uh, the, the, the theme of the workshop here. And uh, also he chose a very um, uh, provocative title, uh, which will get us to think here, right? Because if you think of it, yes, deep learning is really pervading everything we do lately. Um, but you will also tell us that um, there is a long history of this. And even though many of us have heard about deep learning only maybe five or 10 years ago, the, the roots of deep learning actually started here at UC San Diego, right? Um, about 30, 30 years ago. Back in the, uh, in the 80s. Uh, early 80s, yeah. Yes. So with that, so let's, uh, so Terry, give it away. Wonderful, thank you. And, and thank all of you for staying around. Uh, and I thank the for speakers uh, who spoke before me because they really set me up. You'll see that a lot of the things I'm, I'm gonna be telling you really uh, are uh, going to be uh, embroidering on some of the earlier talks that you've heard. So uh, first of all, uh, there is a famous essay by Eugene Wigner, it's in a, a book chapter, on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in physics, which, which is a very interesting essay. And of course, uh, I was a uh, PhD in his department. I took his course, actually, in, in statistical mechanics. Uh, <clears throat> and he, 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 he comes from a, 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 an era which was a where classic, you know, when quantum mechanics was being created and statistical mechanics was really uh, being developed and applied. And, uh, but just to, to have him uh, as one of my mentors was really an extraordinary privilege. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I, I borrowed his title. And uh, what this reflects is the fact that uh, th this is a technology that is, is growing very, very rapidly. Uh, and at the same time that it's growing, it's also uh, attracting a lot of mathematicians to try to explain why it's so effective. There are a lot of paradoxes from statistics, from optimization theory, uh, you know, from the perspective of uh, over-parameterization. Uh, it shouldn't work according to the traditional approach. And I'll just give you the punchline. I actually have an essay that was written for a uh, <clears throat> National Academy meeting that was held last April uh, in Washington on the science of deep learning that was organized by mathematicians, you know, field medal winners, uh, and even one of uh, uh, John Doyle's former students. No, no, you, you mentioned him. What's his name? Uh, right. Well, well it, 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 there have been probably multiple students there. Okay. Yeah, Ben Recht. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, so, uh, and, and so I wrote an essay, and I, I, so I said, what, you know, what really is it? Why is it that it's unreasonable, and what, what's really going on here? And here's my conclusion is that what we are doing now is exploring very, very high dimensional spaces. Almost all of the models and all of the 
physics that's been done has been tried to reduce uh, the complexity of the universe to a few simple equations, a few simple variables, in fact, a few co constants, right? There's not a lot of, there's, there's not a lot of uh, parameters in physical models. But what we're doing here is we're creating uh, networks now that have millions of parameters, billions. You know, the biggest networks now have billion parameters, weights. And uh, that the dimensionality of that space is so high that all of your intuitions about, you know, local minima and, uh, you know, how, how things cluster in that space, subspaces and so forth, uh, and, you know, uh, how vectors are organized, it, it's, it's, it's a completely different animal. It's a different beast. And so what we're doing is uh, with big data and very high dimensional spaces, we, we have a whole new mathematics that we can now begin to explore. And it's just at the very beginning. Okay, so the story begins back in the 1980s. And uh, this, a small number of us were we're focused on trying to explore learning. Learning was being ignored by artificial intelligence. The goal back then was to write a program, literally, that would replicate the, the functionality of human problem solving. And what the problem is that they didn't know the complexity of the problem, and that it, they had no idea how big the program was going to be. And even if they could run it, they had no idea how long, if it would ever end, because the computers at the time were very, very slow compared to today's computers, right? The, uh, the fastest computers you know, could do, uh, in the 1950s, the first computers were about a, a kilohertz clock cycle. And then a little bit later, uh, when, I was, when we were starting, the, the, it was up to a megahertz. Well, now it's, it's, it's gigahertz and beyond. So this is you know, it's a complete new era in terms of the computer power. But back then, you know, it, it, what's, if you have a very uh, small memory, uh, you have to be very efficient, and if the computer is really good at logic, then you look for logical solutions to problems. And unfortunately, the world is not logical. It's not black and white. It's gray. There's a, there's a spectrum. These signals are analog. Uh, it's very high dimensional. Your retina has a million ganglion cells that takes images into your brain, and it's uh, also very uncertain. So you've got to use probability theory. And that's really where modern machine learning is now beginning to explore, right? Learning in that kind of a probabilistic, high data environment. Now, back in the 80s, they made fun of us at, from MIT. Uh, of course, you know, they were king of the hill. They had all the resources. They had uh, DARPA grants. And it, it turned out in that era, it, you know, it didn't matter you, you know, you wrote a grant proposal that you were, the very first grant proposal at MIT was, uh, for the AI lab, was to build a robot that could play ping pong. And they had no idea how difficult that was. In fact, when they got the money, they realized they didn't ask for any money to write a vision program. Because they assumed that, you know, it's going to be easy. So what, what they did was, they, they, I, the story goes, that they assigned it to a graduate student for a summer project. And uh, I thought that was apocryphal, but I met Marvin Minsky. And I, I told him a story, and I said, is this a true story? And he said, you've got your facts wrong. We did not assign it as a summer project to a graduate student. We assigned it to undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. The undergraduates at MIT are pretty smart. <laughs> So, uh, uh, the, and, and so here is the justification. The justification for why we should ignore biology. And, and this was you know, a way that they could justify uh, the, the approach that they were taking. And the, the approach was, suppose you wanted to build an airplane, right? What could be more uh, foolish than studying a bird that flaps its wings? or studying the composition of the feathers. And, and, and that was the end of their argument. You know, this is their justification. So a couple of years ago, there's a biography that came out by David McCulloch, which I very highly recommend. It's basically the biography of the Wright brothers. And, and I didn't know all of this, but the, the reality is that they spent a lot of time studying 
gliding birds because they could keep flying with very minimal power for a long, long time, right? Because they could follow, you know, and even uh, if there's a thermal, they can go up the thermal. So they, they're really taking advantage of aerodynamics. So what they're really asking is, nature has solved problems in aerodynamics. Let's look and see what the wings look like. And, uh, and then they didn't stop there. They took the airfoils, and they built a wind tunnel. So they're both good scientists and good engineers. And then they, they, they've optimized for the wind velocities that they were expecting. And, uh, and, and then they got everything right, and also the wings, okay? They realized that bird feathers are incredibly uh, light. They, they're hollow, you know, quill pens. And, uh, and so that's a very efficient way to reduce mass. And of course, the, wet, the, the, the feathers themselves are very light, but they have a lot of surface area. So this is ideal. So they, they, they didn't build metal airplanes, which is the government was doing, and they, the government completely failed. Uh, but they <clears throat> used cloth, wood, light wood, and cloth. And that's how they got off the ground. OK, so here's, here's what we, we took away, we should take away from this lesson. And it's, it's been repeated over and over again, um, is that what you, nature has solved enormous number of very complex problems. What you want to take away from nature are the principles and, and not necessarily the details. We can't replicate the, the, the fantastic uh, efficiency, for example, of, 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 of uh, cells and how it's reduced uh, in the brain to the uh, molecular level in terms of the signaling process. It's incredibly efficient compared to digital computers. And but if, the, if we use the principles, then we might go into a part of computational space where there are alternative solutions that could solve some of the difficult problems. So here's uh, where we're headed. Uh, <clears throat> last week in Vancouver, uh, there was a, the annual meeting of the Neural Information Processing Systems Conference and Workshop. Uh, met for uh, a week, 14,000 people were present, and 7,000 people weren't present but are on the waiting list who wanted to be there. And uh, ev ev it's, what was made, 140 sponsors, these are big companies that are coming there, uh, including, you know, this is the biggest companies in the United States, you know, Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook, Apple, right, just to name four. So this has clearly attracted a lot of attention in the press and so forth. But what was really interesting was that uh, the, the f workshops, we, you know, this is something uh, after the main meeting where people present their formal results. The workshop breaks down. We have 51 of them, uh, run in 25 in parallel for two days. And they were on every single application area you could possibly imagine including the brain, because every one of these areas of, of science is, is, and engineering and commerce and is collecting huge amounts of data, tremendous amount of data. And machine learning is really the natural tool now that's being used. And uh, of, of the machine learning algorithms, the one that has scaled the best, I'd say as you make it bigger and bigger, it gets better and better, it turns out to be deep learning. So when we were starting in the 80s, I didn't know at the time, but I was studying shallow learning because we could only afford one layer of hidden units between the inputs and the outputs. But, uh, but today, there's, uh, you know, the last time I checked, people are up to 200 layers, which uh, you know, is, is uh, way beyond uh, what nature has done. Now, in, in Gabe's talk, he had a very interesting slide where he talked about this conversion that's going on between human intelligence and artificial intelligence. And uh, th this is an interesting uh, time when it, it may be possible for uh, not everybody, because most of the people there probably were more interested in solving practical problems, getting a job. But uh, there is a smaller subset of people who realize that if you want to push the field forward, go beyond the technology we have today, you're going to have to look, to look more carefully at how brains work. 
because there is a lot more than deep learning. So the deep learning is really a model for the cerebral cortex, which is the thin layer on, on the outside of the, of the brain, which is you know, uh, a recent, relatively recent invention 200 million years ago, uh, neocortex appeared in little rodents. And uh, in humans, it's, uh, it's continued to expand relative to the body weight. Uh, and, and so this is clearly uh, something is good so that more is better, right? It's very rare that you have anything that scales. Airplanes don't scale. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to increase the size of the airplane by a factor of 10, you just can't make an airplane that's 10 times bigger. It's never going to fly. And I think John can tell you why. Are you going to tell us why? <laughs> Yeah, the, okay, the control problem becomes uh, difficult, but also just the materials in terms of the, co the weight of the airplane relative to the lift that you're going to get out of it. Yeah, you're better off on a yeah 10, 10 small planes, and, and right. And actually, there's an uh, interesting. Uh, it was at the, right at the edge, they pushed the edge. Uh, but you know, if you've ever seen Canada geese, they fly information. Do you know why? Because they can actually are more efficient in the vortex because they get a, a little bit of lift, and so airplanes may somehow may some, someday actually be do that, doing that. Uh, but this is the this is the key where I think the we've already seen the benefits of paying attention to biology, and and learning was really the big win that made it possible because instead of writing a program, you can just give it enough examples so that it would figure out how to generalize on its own. So what are the principles that we want to take away from the brain? Well, here are some basic ones. There, uh, first of all, instead of having one processor with a, a big memory sitting next to it, a von Neumann architecture, there are a lot of small processors, 100 billion in your brain. Uh, <clears throat> and there are, uh, on the order of 1,000 connections, 10,000 connections, uh, in some parts of the brain, up to 100,000 connections in the cerebellum, connecting them. And so that means it's on the order of a, of, of, of a million trillion synapses. And, and the synapse is the unit of computation. This is the thing that drives uh, memory and fast processing. Uh, you have to come up with a solution quickly. Uh, and then the question is, how do you encode a problem in this architecture? And Here's, here's the secret sauce. Synapses are plastic. In fact, almost every part in the brain has plasticity on some time scale. And so we shouldn't be thinking of looking for the, the magic algorithm, the single learning algorithm that will solve all problems. No. Uh, even in the cortex, there's a half a dozen learning algorithms that people have already discovered, so who knows how many are there. And if you take the rest of the brain, it's probably hundreds. We, we, you know, there's, it's really a heterogeneous system that we're that has evolved to solve many, many problems. Now, <clears throat> even at the very beginning of artificial intelligence, there was another approach, which actually can be, if you, it's, it's really funny, uh, if, whenever there's an uh, important uh, advance made somewhere, like for example in biology, you know, genes, right? So, uh, you know, it's an obvious that there are genes. And it turns out if you look at the first person who did an experiment who had evidence for these genes that would give traits to specific features to plants and, and, and us, it was Mendel. But Mendel, you know, he, he published, I think he published his paper in a very obscure journal, and it had no impact, zero, no, no citations. <laughs> And it was only 100 years later when you know, people found, uh, you know, actually beginning to isolate the genes and what they did, that they, be, they realized retrospectively that there was this pioneer who actually was way ahead of them, way ahead of them. And so uh, Frank Rosenblatt and McCulloch and Pitts were that, that kind of a, a prophet. Right? They're the ones who had the, the concept. They couldn't do much with it, but let's, let's see what they did do with it. And the perceptron, which uh, Frank Rosenblatt uh, discovered a learning algorithm for was actually first represented in McCulloch and Pitts as a simple model for a single neuron that, that had a, a bunch of inputs that were weighted, summed, thresholded, and then uh, out comes a binary yes or no. 
So this is the world's simplest neural network with one neuron, right? But what was really remarkable was that his learning algorithm was a way to incrementally change the weights by giving it examples, for example, cats and dogs. And every time uh, uh, it, was, uh, it gave an output, you compare it to the correct label. Is this a real cat or a dog according to a human? And uh, if it was right, you went on to the next example. But if it was wrong, you changed the weights to reduce the error. So the next time, you're more likely to classify it correctly. And with the algorithm, with the learning algorithm uh, theorem was that if there exists a set of weights that could solve the problem, then the algorithm, the learning algorithm, was guaranteed to find that set of weights, which is very powerful. And, and you know, mathematically, uh, it's, it's very difficult, uh, generally, to prove convergence for a complex system like this. Uh, now, there was, OK, let me show you the, uh, the problem. The problem was that you have to do a lot of arithmetic. And at the time, computers were really bad at arithmetic. I mean, they were very, very slow at, at doing multiplies. And so Rosenblatt got the equivalent of, of today a million dollars to actually build an analog computer. And, uh, and, and this rack here, you might wonder what's going on. This looks, this looks like a lot of power supply here. And the reason is that the weights were, were actually implemented with potentiometers, you know, the kind where you rotate it and the resistance changes. And it was driven by motors. <laughs> and you know, and, and, and it, 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 it was all doing it in parallel. So you know, it was actually quite efficient for what it was doing compared to a digital computer. But you know, it's, it's, it can imagine this is for one neuron. This whole thing is one neuron. <laughs> it's like you know, you know, if a deep learning network would take up half the planet, right? If you had to use uh, potentiometers. Now, the tradition. Uh, let's go jump to computer vision. So computer vision spent decades and decades and decades making progress, and. The uh, realizing that it was a much more difficult problem, uh, people didn't appreciate the complexity, and I'm not going to go into the details here, except that the, the approach that seemed to be the most promising was to look for features uh, for, in images of objects that were invariant to uh, you know, rotation, translation, scaling, and rotation in 3D. right? And, and, and could also be used for unique features or ones that could distinguish classes of objects. And that way, you know, if you had enough good features, you could make progress, and they did. But the problem was that it took, in order to get the features for a particular object, it was not, it was not a, a simple procedure. What they had to do was to um, use your intuition and test, come up with a bunch of features. It was called SIFT back in the 80s. Uh, David Lowe, and you know they would make progress, but it basically took one graduate student probably a year to come up with features for one object <clears throat> category. So progress was very, very slow, very labor intensive. But, but I want to now use an example to show you why that was hopeless. Okay, why was that hopeless? Okay, it's not so hopeless. I mean, it, it, you, you make progress, but it's very painful, and it's, it's, uh, the performance will never get above a certain point. Uh, and here's the reason. Okay, I'm going to give you a very simple problem that you can solve. How many people here think this is the face of a, of a girl? Okay, uh, could you tell me why you think it's a girl? <laughs> okay, well, why do you think it looks cute? <laughs> yeah, why is it cute? I don't know. Okay, okay, but okay, so how many, okay, I would say about two thirds of you put your hand up. How many think it's, it's a, a, a male? One? Come on. How many didn't put up th their hand? I mean, <laughs> OK, that's the problem. OK. Uh, uh, now, this is really interesting. Actually, I don't know whether this is a boy or a girl. Th we had a set of faces of undergraduates, and we clipped it so that there's no secondary sexual characteristics. There's no hair. There's no Adam's apple. And we trained up a perceptron. And the beauty of a perceptron is that all the information 
is contained in one set of weights that we can illustrate here with positive weights are white and the negative weights are black and the size of the weights proportional to the area. And by the way, it converged to a solution which did better in generalizing than people in my lab at the time, right? So even the simple network could solve a, a difficult problem and the question is how or why? And, and this is a case where we can actually analyze it because we, we can see that there's information from every single location in the face. And when you look at it, you're integrating all that information. You've seen thousands of faces of men and women. And so somehow your, your brain has incorporated a way to integrate all that information, uh, optimize it. Uh, and there are parts of the face that uh, favor men. Apparently men have big noses. Uh, and there are parts of the face, like the cheekbones, that favor women. And so these are some of the things. And, and just looking at features, you might actually have a few features here, a couple distances and so forth. But you, you, you're not taking advantage of all the information that's actually there. And having a system that actually is trained up to optimize, to extract as much information as possible, is always going to win. If, if, now here's the fly in the ointment, in the theorem, you remember it was, if there exists a set of weights that can solve the problem, then the algorithm will find it. Here's the problem. In fact, you can't separate cats from dogs with this, with one layer of weights, right? This only is able to solve problems where it's linearly separable. That is to say, we can form a plane, and, and this is the, the, uh, the way, all the weights are forming a plane, this high dimensional space, to separate the categories. Uh, and, and it was known at the time that, uh, th that, that this, there was this limitation because Minsky and Papert had written a very detailed, uh, it was a geometric analysis of what the problems, what, what was the problem with the uh, you know, class of problems for which uh, this is not going to work. And, and, and they said at the end of their book, you know, after the beautiful math, that you know, if there was a way to generalize this to a multi-layer, uh, perceptron, then it might be possible to actually go beyond and actually solve the more difficult problems. But in their opinion, they did not believe, they doubted that anyone would ever find such an algorithm. And you know, with, with the pro <laughs> and, you know these are people at MIT, they're very smart, Minsky was you know, a genius, and if they said it was unlikely, the rest of the engineering community actually thought that it must be right. In other words, they believed it. And so when I was at Hopkins, I got my first job at Johns Hopkins, electrical engineering department, when I was working on uh, these uh, multi-layer networks, uh, I had a graduate student in electrical engineering, and he was, he was a kind of a black sheep. You know, they, they, they told him that it's a waste of time. Ben, you shouldn't be working uh, with this guy, Sainovsky. He doesn't know anything about uh, the, you know, what's true or not, right? And this was, it turned out that, uh, you know, Ben got his thesis, finally, <laughs> but it really re required uh, a, a change in, uh, a, really, a, 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 I, what I call the, a revolution in the way that we train networks. And the, clearly the problem is uh, these uh, hidden units, uh, you know, there, we do have in our spinal cord, we have a reflex where the sensory input comes in and it's a motor neuron, makes a synapse, and that's your uh, reflex. But almost all the information processing goes through many, many layers into the visual cortex, hierarchy of areas, and then a lot of other machinery that has to go into it in order to make uh, the performance uh, as good as it is. And so <clears throat> it actually, the very first learning algorithm for multi-layer networks was called the Bolson machine. And this was a project that Jeff Hinton and I worked on back in the 1980s, early 80s. And it really, uh, I, it broke the log jam because uh, very quickly people began to realize that this is, there's a whole area here that hasn't been plowed for about 25 years. And I have to say, I, I really uh, am very grateful to Minsky and Papert for holding back the field so that I could actually be there <laughs> to move it forward. Uh, and, 
Boltzmann machine was uh, taken from uh, physics. It's uh, based on statistical mechanics. And, and, the, and I'm not going to go into any of the details except to say that it's actually, in some ways, much more elegant than backprop. Uh, it used Hebbian learning, which means the learning rule is local. You don't need to have a global error signal. All you have to do is look at the correlations between inputs and outputs in two different phases. The, the phase when you have uh, the inputs coming in, and then another phase where you put it, you cut off the inputs and you just let it free, uh, f f run freely and, and subtract the two. And that turns out to be an incredibly simple algorithm that actually works. We proved that, you know, both in terms of simulations but also mathematically that uh, it was, uh, it, it was able to, in fact, what it really was doing was not just memorizing of, of input-output relationship. It was uh, modeling the probability distribution of the inputs. And it, it was a supervised and an unsupervised version, right? So it didn't need any labels. If you just give it a lot of examples, it would eventually figure out you know, how to uh, be able to figure out the statistical properties of the structure in the input set. So this is, was a very, those, that's what was good about it. What was bad was that you had to come to equilibrium, you had to collect statistics. So it, uh, it was very slow, and especially for computers at the time, it, it, were, it meant you, you really had to have very small networks. Uh, but we showed that, in fact, it did solve these problems that the perceptron couldn't solve. Well, here we are today. Uh, just to give you a sense for what they're being used for, I'm gonna give you a couple examples. But uh, this is a traditional feed-forward network, and this is a medical application. Uh, some inputs could be uh, images, for, uh, CT. Uh, some inputs could be heart rate. You saw the, the beautiful data from Todd. And some of it could be genetic. And so the idea is that it goes through several layers. If features are extracted through the learning with the outputs uh, telling you uh, what the uh, diagnosis turned out to be um, after the, all the tests have been done, and the patient died. So now, you know, ground truth is uh, what happens after the, uh, all the facts are in. So here's an example, a practical example. Uh, so there are about 2,000 different types of skin lesions, and if you're a dermatologist, you have to learn which ones are benign and which ones are fatal, cancerous. How many, okay, there are four of them here. One of them is cancerous. Which one? Any ideas? Which one? The bottom, which one? Left? Okay, you're right. How do you, how'd you know? You what? Okay, I, I, I actually, I just took these. I have no idea which one is cancerous. <laughs> I took this from the, from the website. Uh, okay, yes. The what? Ah. Okay, now this is a nice little pimple, right? So it's probably, this, this is the one you think is cancerous, right? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just glad that uh, we, they were able to find it before the uh, person died. Now, I wrote this book, came out about a year ago, and I would, it, it chronicles this whole story uh, and it also tries to give a sense for where it's heading, where's the future, and both in terms of practical impact on people's lives, jobs, and also in terms of where the science is going. And, and so, uh, you know, I, there was a little bit of speculation in it, but you know, it was a lot of fun, and uh, I try, it was an antidote to all of these scare stories that people are gonna lose their jobs, uh, humans are gonna be obsolete, They're, you know, that AI is gonna take over, uh, there's going to be a terminator that's going to terminate us. I mean, this, this is all fear-mongering, right? This is apocalyptic. And then, of course, there's another press uh, uh, direction which, oh, everything is going to be so much better because AI is going to help us uh, and, and it will you know, make life so much easier for us and it will cure all our diseases and teach all our children, right? This is the other extreme. Well, life is always somewhere in between. And the problem is that it's almost impossible to imagine where. So here's an example to show you how little imagination we have. In the mid-90s, the internet went live to the public. How many here who lived through that period could have imagined the impact it would have on every part of your life? 
streaming movies, uh, music industry completely disrupted, uh, social media, uh, impact on politics. And you know, it's, it goes on and on and on. And so the, uh, the, the point is that none of us could have imagined all of the things that were going to happen once you have the infrastructure in. Because it, these, are, these are things that you know, were not really designed to, 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 to predict. It's, it's, we're, we're things that we're creating uh, the technology, but uh, they're used for things that nobody could possibly have imagined, including uh, bad as well as good. That's the problem. All technologies can be used for bad and good. And so you have to regulate them so that they aren't, the bad guys don't get to use them, right? Well, we're just at the beginning now. We don't even know what the bad applications are really going to be. But you know, we're, we're learning every day. We get some feedback. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that one of the speculations that I had in the book, uh, and this was learning how to diagnose, uh, it will soon be possible for anyone with a smartphone to take a photo of a suspicious skin lesion and have it diagnosed instantly, a process that now requires a visit to a doctor's office, a long wait for the lesion to be screened by an expert, and the payment of a substantial bill. How many people have lived through this? Right, this is very common. OK. Uh, so there was an article that came out in Nature where they uh, got a hold of a, a big panel of experts, dermatological experts, and they compared them to a deep learning network that was trained uh, to diagnose the lesions. And it turned out that uh, the, 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 the uh, network, deep learning network, was as good as the best doctors. 92% each, which was interesting. So, and, and, and here's what I speculated. I speculated that uh, it should be, let's say, uh, it should be possible to take a picture, an image of the lesion, send it up to the cloud, have a deep learning network diagnose it within a minute, right? And tell you. If it's, is, it, is it likely to be cancerous or not? And if it is cancerous, then you should immediately go to a doctor's office and show them uh, so they can do the relevant testing, make sure, uh, find out what, it, what, make sure what it is. And so literally like a, a week after the book came out, I'm, li I'm listening to NPR and there is this uh, commercial for First Derm in which they say they have an app on the phone and for $29 or something, oh, it, you can, uh, uh, use it to uh, diagnose your skin lesion, right? And they said that they had uh, a customer who recently uh, uh, had a, the, their boyfriend had a, a mole or something on the back that looked like it could be, you know, it was growing, so they weren't sure what it was. She took a picture. They, it, she got, within a minute, she got the, uh, the results and it said, Run, don't walk to a doctor's office. This is the worst form of cancer. <laughs> and she probably saved his life, right? I mean, he, he was on his back. I mean, how often do you look at your back? And, um, and, and this is really, uh, it can happen now. I mean, this is going to save many, many, many lives. So this is really fantastic opportunities. And it's uh, just this is one out of thousands of examples at the, the, the NeurIPS meeting in Vancouver. There was a whole uh, there was a session. Uh, on, on health applications and almost every area where you have enough data, you can train up networks to do uh, as good or better than doctors. Now there's a coda to this, which is even more interesting, which is that after they did this test with the skin lesions, and the doctors and the, 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 the uh, AI were doing uh, about 92%, they didn't ask, well, suppose you gave the doctor this network as an assistant. How well would they do now on another set of skin lesions? 98%. So the implication is that the, the, the two, uh, the, the, both the doctor and the AI are, are looking at somewhat different things, independent sources of information. And it reduced the error by a factor of four, right, from 8% to 2%. That's a tremendous improvement. And so the book really uh, uses this as the bottom line, that the future is going to be based on a uh, partnership. It's a partnership in which the, the deep learning is going to improve our performance across the board, no matter what your profession, including if you're a scientist. 
And my favorite applications, and I think the biggest impact is going to be on science. And I'll just give you a few examples. This one has to do with uh, super resolution. Uh, and, and these are actually 20 micron fluorescent spheres. Uh, and if you use a confocal microscope, which has a diffraction limit of about a half micron, you get these big blobs, okay? But if you use a, 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 a fancy super resolution microscope, you can do a lot better. So here's, here's the very same field, uh, if, but now with, under super resolution, and you can see these JKL are here, and you can see, uh, maybe you can't see it, but uh, for example, it resolves this blob into two peaks, uh, and, and, uh, and even here. I mean, in other words, it, 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 it's like a factor of three better resolution. But now what you do is you take this as the input to a deep learning network, and you train it up with a bunch of these, and out pops a prediction for what the super resolution microscope is going to do, which uh, from all practical quantitative uh, measurements, as you can see, is, is actually doing as well as the super resolution. Super resolution microscope costs a factor of 10 times more. It has to collect so many photons that it eventually bleaches the slide, which means that you can only use it like you know once a day to, for one image. Confocal microscope you know, it only takes less than a minute to collect the data, and then less than a minute to run the deep learning network. You use just inference. And uh, every confocal microscope can now, in any lab in the, in the world, can now be super resolution. And just think about it now. What's the consequence here? You can uh, take a piece of tissue, and you can uh, <clears throat> put an antibody on it, take a picture for one a protein, and then wash that off and put another antibody on for another protein. So that means you can get like pictures for 30 different proteins on the same piece of tissue. And uh, you can do it all in an hour, right? So this is really a technology which is, I think, going to have a huge impact on cell biology. So here, by the way, is the quantitation. Uh, this is the uh, ground truth with the, with the super resolution. Uh, this is what the confocal gives you, and this is what deep learning gives you. So it's, it's amazingly good. It's, it's really astonishing. I mean, it basically somehow deep learning learns a transfer function for, uh, to create, to, it, you know, the image looks blurry, but there's, there's got to be information there somewhere that's able to pull out, right? It's, it's, it's things that look like noise actually contain information, and, and it's figured out that mapping. It's, it's really it's, it's magic. Uh, one other application is connectomics. And so here you have a stack of electron micrographic images of a piece of brain. And then at the end, what you'd like to do is reconstruct the neurons in it uh, with all the dendrites and synapses. And the problem is that uh, it's, it, it, because of the noise, it's often the case that you have a break uh, where uh, you don't have a continuity between a piece of dendrite. Uh, and also, uh, sometimes you get a merge where you get a piece of uh, uh, in this case, it uh, looks like it's a, a piece of axon and a soma, which are labeled as being part of the same unit. So uh, again, it's a case where deep learning has revolutionized the whole business in the sense that uh, this is uh, from uh, Viren Jain, who's at Google. Uh, uh, if you just look at the expected run length, how far do you go before you expect a break or a merge? And you can see that. Uh, it, 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 you know, in the early days, uh, with convolutional neural networks, they were able to do 20 microns, which isn't very far at all. These things can last, can go for millimeters. Uh, but you see, up to up now, we can, with, with the latest version of what some call a flood filling network, in which you actually look at the whole stack and you go up and down. There's more information. Uh, you can get beyond a millimeter, and this slide is already two, uh, more than a year old, and so now they're uh, up to several millimeters. So this is really. Uh, transformative technology. And it's being used by physicists. It's, it's being used by chemists for designing molecules. Uh, I bumped into Daphna Kohler. She was a computer scientist at Stanford. She founded Coursera, the, the massively open online course. Uh, and, but now she has a biotech company. And she said that you know, they, they, they have half the people are doing deep learning. The other half are doing experiments to collect data for deep learning. <laughs> And he said, she said that it's just astonishing how fast this 
cycle goes because it used to be the case you have to guess, you know, a chemist had a guess from biophysics, you know, what to put a group here or there. But, but now you can just predict, you know, what would be the optimal solution. So, uh, so that's a, just a flavor of, of what, what's happening out there. It's just, it's just a very practical, very, uh, it, it does require a lot of computer power, but uh, now hardware chips are being built that are going to improve the performance by at least a factor of 10 in terms of the power required. Okay, so, so far I've been telling you about what deep learning can do for you. Now I'm going to turn uh, around in the last part of the talk, tell you about what we can do for deep learning. In other words, can neuroscience, can the, can the neuroscientist help take deep learning to the next step, next stage, improve it? And there are a lot of ways that can happen, but I'm just going to give you one of them. And, uh, and you've already seen this uh, in, in John's talk, but, but this one is more up to date. You can tell from the graphics, <laughs> but it's the same slide. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the focus for deep learning has been on, on maps, really, uh, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, and this hierarchy. But uh, th there's a lot more going on down here in terms of uh, what synapses are actually doing. They're filled with biochemical reactions with many different timescales. Uh, and I think, th and I have a project that's going on to actually on uh, uh, disentangle all of that chemistry and figure out what the learning, what the real learning algorithm is. But that's a, a different story. I want to tell you another story, which is going upwards. So you know, these deep learning networks are really very narrow in terms of uh, each one is designed and built to solve one problem. And just to give you the right scale, it turns out that, uh, say, the biggest uh, deep learning networks have about a billion synapses, <clears throat> which sounds like a lot, but in a cubic millimeter of cortex, there's a, bi a billion real synapses, right, which are incredibly more complicated than just a number. You know, you know, I was telling you that there's hundreds of unique proteins and a tremendous number of interactions that are occurring. And, and this is really uh, uh, probably, if you had to simulate it, right, it, it would be probably 100 variables that you would have to keep track of. So, uh, so a billion of these in a cubic millimeter, right? What does that mean? It means that in your cortex is probably something like 100,000, the equivalent of 100,000 deep learning networks. Now think about this, okay? If we keep building these deep learning networks, how are we going to harness them, put them together so that they, they, working together they can solve more difficult problems? Right? How, how are we going to do that? That's, that's a communications problem. It's a control problem. And, uh, and no one is even facing that yet because we're still at the stage of, you know, one network, one problem. People are beginning to think about it. But again, nature has already been there. And so maybe we can uh, learn something from looking inside uh, the cortex and seeing what really goes on. Okay? And that's what I want to tell you about. But let me start out with a problem that the the brain has. So I uh, came here to this meeting. I met a few people I've never met before. Uh, I now know their name, what their face looks like. I've talked to them, so I, have, I know what they sound like. I may even have shaken their hands, so I know whether it's hot or cold. Now, if each one of those modalities is in a different part of the cortex, right? Here's the faces in the fusiform face area and the auditory uh, cortex and temporal, superior temporal cortex. And uh, somatosensory is in the parietal cortex. So they're separated by many centimeters, right? And, and somehow, and, and then there's the context of where you met the person. And that's the hippocampus. So we have information spread out, distributed, throughout all the different parts of the brain. And how are you going to stitch them together? So that tomorrow, I will remember all of those pieces. I'll be, able, I'll be able to image their face. I'll be able to remember their name, hopefully. If, uh, it, that, that becomes a little more difficult as you get older, but <laughs> we're pretty good at it. And, uh, and how does that happen? Okay, well, it, that's the problem of uh, stitching together all these uh, deep learning networks. And, and how do you do that in such a way that you don't get interference and you don't forget what you already know? That's called lifelong learning. There are a lot of technical problems that are going to have to be solved. Uh, right now, uh, these deep learning networks are coddled. They're, they're the, the data set is is put together at great expense and labels. 
and uh, you know you train them up, and once you've trained them up, that's it. They're they're, they're put into production, right? They're, you're not going to retrain it, and if you do, you're going to have to start from scratch with with another data set, or you're going to have to enhance the data set. You can't just add a couple new things, because if you add a couple new things, you're going to destroy the performance on the other things that had learned, right? So there, there's something wrong here, and, and you know, there's a lot of things that people are trying to do, which are going to probably reduce the interference, but how, we, the question is, can we learn from the brain, how the brain does it? And we actually have accumulated a lot of evidence, and we think that this is why we fall asleep every night. Right? This is a big mystery. Why is it that we all have to sleep for on the order of eight hours a night? A third of our life is spent in bed. Why? What good is it? You know, my, I, I told my mother I was working on sleep, and we don't know why we sleep. And she said, isn't it obvious? It's because you're tired. <laughs> smart. My mother's really smart. By the way, she also is an expert on vision. Um, so I once told her that, you know, Ma, uh, you know, you're, when you look out in the world, you can only see clearly in the little patch a few degrees across, about the size of your thumb. She said, that's not true for me. I said, no, it's true for everybody. She said, no, any place I look, it's equally sharp. <laughs> and that's because we, we have a device for rapidly positioning the eye. So for all practical purposes, we can do it three times a second. And, you know, we, we stitch together the information and it's not, a, it's not it's, we're not aware of it. We're just, we just do it. And it's, it's a very efficient way. You, you don't need to have a big camera with uniform resolution across it the way we have in our, 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 our cell phones. It's a much better technology. Also, it requires a much better control system. OK, so here is what sleep looks like. When you fall asleep, your brain doesn't stop working. It goes into a completely different mode that is much more synchronous, both spatially and temporally. So here's uh, EEG, recording from the scalp. Uh, when you're awake, you can see that it's low amplitude and high frequencies. But when you fall asleep, you go into something called slow wave sleep, uh, 2 to 4 hertz, much higher amplitude. And in between, there are intermediate stages of sleep. And one in particular where you get these sleep spindles, which are 10 to 14 hertz bursts of, of, of action potentials that originate in the thalamus and then project into the cortex. And there's a loop, there's a feedback loop. So these become very highly synchronous. And uh, it's believed that because of uh, experiments that have been done uh, by psychologists, that this is very important for memory consolidation. That is to say, if you look at people who have trouble consolidating memory, they don't have many spindles. If you give a drug that Im improves the density of spindles, then their memory imp retention improves. So you, know, you can intervene, and you can actually see how the relationship is. And so the question is, uh, how does that work and what's going on? So here's some uh, basic data from Mircea Steriot. I collaborated with him for 15 years, and we've published together maybe 30 papers. Uh, so this is at low temporal resolution. You can see you get these bursts in both the thalamus and the cortex at about the same time, a little bit first in the thalamus, because that's where they originate. Uh, here are two that have been blown up, uh, two seconds. So you can see they last for a few seconds, and they have a very characteristic uh, uh, bursting. It's not just a single spike, it's actually a burst of spikes. Now, <clears throat> Mircea believed, on the basis of you know, recording from two or more locations, that the synchrony, uh, that these uh, sleep signals were synchronous over the whole cortex. Um, uh, and, and so th that's, that's going to be the, the, the issue. That's the question that we're going to look at with modern techniques. Uh, so a lot is known about the anatomy. I've already told you about the, the thalamus. Uh, there's the relay cells that project up. And then there's the cortical cells from layer 6 that project down. And then there's a really interesting structure here called the reticular nucleus of the thalamus, which are pure inhibitory cells. And they only have one output, which is to back to the thalamus. So there's a reciprocal inhibitory uh, circuit here, which is responsible for generating the sleep spindles. Uh, Orlando Stex, who was a postdoc in my lab, and I you know, published many papers together, collected them together in this monograph, which is going to be reissued, bringing it up to date uh, uh, early next year. OK, so here's now uh, the breakthrough. So he worked, Richard worked on cats. And, and cats are great because they like to sleep a lot. So. 
Uh, but uh, we had this opportunity to work with uh, uh, Eric uh, Hallgren and also uh, Sid Cash at MGH. Uh, and at MGH, they uh, have uh, implant these uh, rays of electrodes uh, in epilepsy patients. And you saw this uh, in Miriam's talk. Is she still here? Oh, there you are. Okay, good. Yeah, so same technology. These are really crude. They're centimeter space, but there's 64 of them here. And uh, one, the, the, here's a sleep spindle that gets recorded from one of these electrodes in black, and all the others are in gray. And so what you can see, if you don't, you know, if you probably can't see in the back, but what I see is, is a smear. This peak here is not perfect, and there's noise. And up until uh, the analysis that I'm going to tell you about that Lyle Muller uh, uh, was able to apply to the data, which was taken from fluid dynamics from physicists who were dealing with, with these uh, uh, turbulent uh, media uh, in order to be able to uh, go beyond just looking at the peak, uh, told us a very different story. Which, is, which really surprised us. So here is uh, the electrodes that are colored in grayscale, uh, where we've normalized the amplitude between minus one black and plus one white. And you can see that there's, it's not uniform across the whole cortex. And I'm going to play a movie so you can see what the pattern actually looks like. So follow the white dots. Temporal, parietal, frontal. Temporal, parietal, frontal. So that's one cycle. One cycle, once around. One cycle, once around. And that, that can happen thousands of times during the night. Uh, and, and in fact, if, if uh, two are, uh, if, you, if you compare the pattern in one cycle, in one, from one cycle to the next, that if they're highly correlated, like 0.9, then that very same pattern will appear thousands of times during the night. So there's something about the uh, sleep spindle which is projecting, is, is doing something, stitching together different parts of the cortex. Uh, information, that's our uh, working hypothesis. And so how could that possibly happen? Well, first of all, uh, what uh, the secret uh, sauce to, to Lyle's uh, analysis turned out to be not to look at the peak, but to look at the phase. Because there's a lot of information about the phase, not just at the peak, but it, that is more reliable. And you saw that in... Todd's beautiful analysis of the waves, which are much, much slower. But nonetheless, it turns out you can, you can really extract a lot of information if you have to write an analytic technique. By the way, this is the story of modern neuroscience, which is that uh, not only is there a huge amount of data, but the tools and techniques that are now being used to analyze them are much, much, much better than the traditional ones that people did by hand, which really was more like stamp collecting, at least in uh, <coughs> systems neuroscience. Now, uh, one of the problems with epilepsy patients is that if you see something, you don't know whether it may be an artifact from the epilepsy, because their cortex typically has been epileptic seizures for years, decades. And, um, and the reason that they are having an operation is to find the focus so they can take them out. These are drug-resistant uh, uh, cases. And so we teamed up with April Benesich, who uh, has a baby lab in New Brunswick, uh, Rutgers University. And it, it, it turns out that babies have beautiful spindles. And uh, this is something I, I hadn't thought about. Why, why is, is, these are actually very, very uh, high amplitude. The reason is that they, at this point, their skull is soft, hasn't, hasn't really fully, sutures haven't closed yet. And that means that recording from the top of the scalp is almost equivalent to having an electrode right on the cortex. So it, what a wonderful. Uh, you know, for us, uh, opportunity to study these sleep spindles. So here's uh, what the prep looks like. By the way, this is not April, although the baby does look very cute. Uh, <clears throat> high density. And now I'm going to, again, play a movie for you, and you're going to see what it looks like. With the epilepsy patients, they only put it in on one side, one hemisphere. So we never really knew what happened across the hemispheres, but now we know from the baby. So it swirls, and every once in a while it jumps. But it, you may have, if, if it is 3D rotating pattern, it, it's, it's not as easy to see, but we have analyzed it, and so we know what that looks, what, what's really going on. So you see the swirling. It's going back and forth between the hemispheres. So that's really a <clears throat> confirmation 
And we've actually followed it over time. Uh, we, we have six month, 12 months, and 18 month babies. And uh, it turns out that uh, not only does it go counterclockwise, but sometimes it goes clockwise. And the ratio of clockwise to counterclockwise changes as the baby matures. So there's something, even something even more interesting going on with babies. Okay, now uh, we come to the mechanism. Can we understand what causes these? I mean, this is really global spatial temporal pattern. This is not just uh, synchrony. It's not like everything's doing the same thing, and it's not random, right? There's got to be some explanation. So here's uh, one possible explanation, which is uh, a, a simple model from uh, Kuramoto, uh, which is coupled oscillators that are being driven by the difference between their phases. Uh, and there's two different parameters here. There's one which is the coupling strength between the coupled oscillators and the frequency. And, and this is just a, a simple oscillator, uh, uh, which has uh, been very, very well analyzed. And what I'm showing you here is actually a simulation of what the uh, pattern looks like. Each one of these is a phase of one of the oscillators at the different levels of coupling from low to strong. So first, look at the low coupling, very little synchrony. Uh, intermediate, uh, moderate synchrony, but there's still some that escape. And then if you have really strong coupling, basically they're all uh, synchronous with slightly different phases. So here's our, our, our hypothesis. Our hypothesis is that what's driving this are the time delays in the axons, the long distance axons that uh, couple different distant parts of the cortex. And it's known that their velocity is about three meters per second. And what that means is that uh, depending on how far you've got to go, the, there could be time delays up to 10, 20, 30 milliseconds. So we took the Kuramoto model, we modified it by putting in time delays. And we got the connectivity uh, from the Human Connectome Project using DTI. They're, you're able to get the major fiber tracks, the, the big long ones. And so, uh, so the WIJ, which is the actual connectivity from DTI, is, is fixed. So again, the only uh, uh, variables here are, are two numbers. We're going to have a single frequency for all of them, and we're going to vary that, and we're going to vary the coupling strength. So we call this the delay Kuramoto model. So first of all, the question is, you know, does it ever become uh, lock in? Does it lock in uh, the way that the Kuramoto model is? And the answer is yes, it does, but it takes a stronger coupling, kappa. Here's the Kuramoto model. And at 10, it begins to synchronize. And you see it's almost perfectly synchronized by the time it gets out here to the 10s of the fourth. And uh, the, the delays put in more randomness. So it's not going to be as perfect as the, the synchrony you see here. But what is it? OK, uh, so we're, now we're going to vary the frequency. Uh, the, so we can vary the oscillator frequency you know, for, for, over the range of physiological frequencies. Uh, and by the way, we put in you know, three meters per second in terms of the distance, so that it was as, again, it was not, it was a measurement, it was not a variable. And now I'm gonna show you the simulation of the delay Kuramoto model. Very simple model, I mean, it really is uh, super simple, but it, it can reproduce a lot of the things that we see in the more complex brain. So here we go. Uh, frontal, temporal, parietal, so it, it has, has inherent in it. We didn't put this in. It just came right out, right, from the connectivity that we're getting these uh, circular traveling waves. But what if we change the frequency? Suppose we put in 40 hertz instead of 10 hertz. What will happen then? Well, it's chaotic. There isn't any uh, global coherence at all. So that means that there's only some frequencies, and then so we were able to figure that out by varying the two different uh, variables over a wide range. And we have a, 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 a measure here of how well the thing is coupled, a rho, uh, which goes from zero to a half. And you can see that the sweet spot here is around 10 hertz. And in fact, the uh, human spindles are about 10 to 14 hertz. So it's really quite accurate in terms of uh, being in the right location, and a relatively small coupling constant you know, on, on the order of uh, 500. So this is really, uh, I think, again, uh, a confirmation that this simple mechanism with time delays, putting time delays in, can actually improve things. And in addition, uh, there's a, a bonus that comes out of this, because the, the, one of the leading mechanisms for plasticity in cortical synapses is called spike time-dependent plasticity, STDP. And it turns out that. Uh, there was a real problem that people thought that you couldn't use it for uh, synchronous uh, uh, <clears throat> spindles. And the reason is that 
if it bursts here and here at the same time, then by the time that the burst from this location got here, say there was a 20 millisecond delay, it would always be after the burst. And that means uh, post before pre, and pairing post before pre produces long-term depression. And so what the prediction would be, if it was synchronous, uh, you would basically disconnect all of the cortical areas, right? And so now, with the, with the time delay driving it, the, the burst arrives exactly at the same time as the cell is going to burst uh, because of the fact that we have this traveling wave. So now you're, you're, you're able to both strengthen the synapses and weaken the synapses in, the, in a much more efficient way. And the other thing that came out of this, I'm not going to show you the data, but it turns out when we analyze the data, the, the relative timing, the jitter, was incredibly low on the order of a, you know, five milliseconds or less in terms of the arrival times from one cycle to the next. So it, you know, it's an incredibly uh, complex machine, but you can get the whole thing to be operating in the millisecond range. And, and the SCDP itself has a, a window that's plus or minus 10 milliseconds, so it immediately tells you that not only is the dynamics precise, but so is the mechanism for determining the strength of the synapse. That's very, very, very important. And one last thing that came out of it was a, a puzzle that came out of the uh, human literature, which is that the claim was that the frequency for the spindle was uh, different in the prefrontal cortex compared to the back of the brain. And that, you know, many papers have reported this, not something that uh, was um, expected or understood. So here's what we did. Uh, we, we averaged, we, here's the prefrontal cortex. We averaged the uh, power as a function, uh, as you can see, the power is a function of frequency in the front of the brain compared to the back of the brain. And so here are the two curves. And what you can see is the anterior is a little bit slower, and that's what's reported in literature, than the back of the brain. This is really interesting. It means that we have this dynamical system that, uh, because of the connectivity, produces slightly different frequencies in the front and the back of the brain. And again, uh, this is uh, not completely unexpected, and it's something that comes right out of the model without any changing any parameters. It's just, it's, it's there. And we're in the process, of, we have an analytic technique for actually analyzing the equation, so we actually know why. And I'm not going to tell you about that today. It was a paper that we're about to resubmit to Fizzer of Letters, uh, which is actually the first time anybody has ever analyzed uh, delay differential equations for the, this kind of a model. OK. And so I told you the story about sleep spindles as traveling waves. This is a heresy in neuroscience. And many of my colleagues don't know what to make of it, right? And if you go into the literature, it turns out that there's, a, there's literally dozens of papers where people have put in arrays of electrodes and have seen traveling waves. And all of them have been ignored. Nobody knows what to do with them. You know, it's, uh, so I'm going to show you a recording that was made over 10 years ago by uh, Thanos Siapas at Caltech, where an array of electrodes in the hippocampus, which is important for long-term memory. And it's uh, uh, along the long axis here from the dorsal to the ventral pole, or actually anterior to posterior in the human. And so let's see if we can get this to work. Ah, uh, okay, I've got to, I'm gonna go out of here. Duplicate signs. It's really quite remarkable. So here you can see it's going from uh, anterior to posterior. Wang, wang, wang. And it's a half cycle across the hippocampus. And, and, uh, Yuri Bujaki, who's one of the kings of uh, oscillations in the cortex, has confirmed this. There's, there's no doubt about this. But again, if you go back into literature, it turns out that the, almost every frequency band, there are oscillations that are not synchronous. They're traveling waves. The cortex is filled with traveling waves. And I had this epiphany hearing Todd that it's the cortex is recapitulating peristalsis. <laughs> and, and if you look at this from a physics perspective, it shouldn't surprise anybody. 
right? Look at physics. Every information uh, channel that we have goes by traveling waves, sound waves. It goes through a medium, electromagnetic waves. These, at end, it goes through a medium. You have to have a medium. What? No, 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 I'm not, uh, no, no, the, the details are completely different. I'm just saying at the level of information, right, uh, the cost is, right, completely different. And physics is different from the brain. But we can learn something from physics, okay? And, and, and we, we, what I think we've learned is that the cortex is a medium. It's a medium and, you know, it's kind of clunky and maybe it takes a lot of time and energy to move things around. But, you, you know, you can do things with a traveling wave you can, there, there's interference patterns. There's all sorts of interesting things with holograms that come out of physics. Uh, I'm not saying that, and, and, you know, we don't know what the, the function is. Uh, and, and we're just beginning. We have a lot of hypotheses, and I'm collaborating with experimental people to test some of them. But the point is that this is really a completely new um, way of thinking about activity patterns in the cortex. And you might ask, why did it take so long, right, if, if it's there? Uh, and... Uh, Here's our review paper that came out last year uh, with Lyle and John Reynolds, who's uh, my partner at the Salk Institute. Uh, and so we made a long list of all the papers, and we came up with a whole list of possible computational functions. And, and this is really, uh, I think, exciting. And why, why, is it, why was it missed? Why was it missed? Well, here's, here's my explanation that since the time of Hubel and Weasel, when they first recorded from the visual cortex with the tungsten microelectrode, they recorded one neuron at a time. You will never see a traveling wave by recording from one electrode. Right? It's like, what's the sound of one hand clapping? Right? Uh, you need to have at least two electrodes. And even then, if you don't know, know what you're looking for, it's, it looks like you're look, you know, that there may be noise and so forth. And in fact, it even explains a, a puzzle. When Hubel and Weasel reported their results, uh, they compared, uh, you know, the spike train from one trial to the next, and they discovered that the spikes were variable. The, the number of spikes, the timing of the spikes, and sometimes they got no response at all. So what did they do? They averaged. If you average these sleep spindles, all the information gets wiped out. You have to look at single trials. And they, you know, but they, they since then, everybody has averaged over 10, 20 trials in order to get a histogram. And that's what people publish, right? Well, you, you don't see things, you don't have to average over 10 trials, right? You just need one trial. So there's something wrong. There, you know, there has to be, the, the, the information has to be in those spikes. And it has to be done with a much higher precision than anybody thought. They, everybody used to think that these vari the variability was noise. And uh, I think somebody put up a slide, I think it was one of you. Oh, John, you put up a slide which actually is the big discovery, which is that the noise is actually has a huge amount of information about the behavior, about every little twitch. Uh, every, every, it was taking, data taken from a mouse with whiskers and so forth. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of information there. This, this, it, the brain is, uh, things that were considered to be just random variability turn out to be very rich in information. You know, one man's noise is another man's signal. And so we really have to rethink a lot about the, the physics of what's going on, the learning algorithms that are being implemented, and ultimately have a global picture rather than having this, you know, single unit picture of uh, which is, comes from the last century, which I which I now think is is uh, something that has held us back. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Questions. So one question. You're okay. Um, is uh, how to how do you actually implement some of that idea of a wave in current models, deep learning models? And the other is, um, what is the role of training data sets and where humans actually you know ground truth? What can we do that would actually uh, create more of a synergy between? Uh, what we can collect data on and what uh, deep learning models can do. Okay, uh, so th that uh, is, is, a gr is really the next step. 
So here's, here's the picture. The picture is that we think that you fall asleep so that all of these deep learning networks that are different parts of the cortex can get stitched together with STDP. That's the working hypothesis, right? And so it, it means that if a baby, it, when we have a bunch of deep learning networks, uh, they have to communicate with each other. And uh, that may be dangerous to do when you're awake. Uh, in fact, uh, here, here's, a, here's, here's a, a problem that a lot of people have. A young couple, uh, they buy a house, and uh, you know, they, 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 they can't afford to move out of it while it's being renovated. Because you know, the workmen are going to come in. There's going to be dust all over the place. They're going to turn the water off and so forth. And so this is actually a study that's been done. It turns out that your probability of having a divorce is like factor two greater if you stay in the house while it's being renovated, rather than go off and take a vacation. Right? And so this is what, what probably the reason why we go to sleep is so that we don't get the daily experience uh, mixed up with this process where you go offline, cut off the sensory input, and then stitch it all together. Right? It, it, it makes more sense to separate those in two phases. Just like in the Bolson machine, awake and asleep phase. So, uh, and, and so I think, I think that deep learning networks, when they finally grow up, are going to have to fall asleep just like we do. Okay. Yeah, I actually have a few questions. Um, <clears throat> so one of the questions is, if you're trying to understand the function of these traveling waves during sleep, do you, do you see any hints of replay of perhaps faster traveling wave patterns that happen during wake? Is, is there any experimental evidence on that yet? Yeah, so there's a very large literature of, on rodents. So, uh, so here's what we know. By the way, this, is, this field is also just uh, rapidly exploding because we can now do them in humans. And Eric Hallgren is one of the leaders. Uh, Bruce McNaughton is also one of the leaders. He gave a talk here recently. So uh, here's, here's what we know from the rodents, though, is that the rodent, uh, you give the rodent a, a, a trail that's got to go and, and memorize a series of turns. And it turns out that the rodent hippocampus has these place fields which are located at the, the, the cell only fires at a particular location in the maze in this uh, complex uh, pattern that it has to learn of, of movement through a, a kind of a tunnel. And, and, and now the rat goes to sleep. Why am I telling you this? You study this. <laughs> we have a ringer here from MIT. Uh, and it's replayed, the very same pattern. It's as if the rat in its mind was running down the maze and it was remembering it. It's played back, but it's played back at six times the speed of the actual running. And this triggers a sleep spindle. And so the thought is that uh, it's a prod. It's a way for the hippocampus, which is known to be responsible for rapid uh, learning of events and uh, unique objects that you want to be able to put into your memory store. But the way that you integrate it is not by uh, going directly into the cortex, but temporarily into the cortex and then using the hippocampus to, with the sleep spindles to sort of stitch together the details so that at the end uh, you'll, you'll have all the, 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 you know, the big store in the cortex, which is you know, th millions of times more than you have uh, in the you know, hippocampus. Uh, can be, that hippocampus can be freed up. You don't need it anymore after a couple of months. So, so this is, you know, again, it's, it's based on a lot of rat data, but there's more and more evidence now that you have these uh, what are called sharp, sharp wave ripples that originate in the hippocampus. And, and it's very precise in terms of the timing because it's, uh, it's not just uh, th these ripples are at like 100 hertz or higher. So th there's an incredible rapid fire pattern that's getting shot back into the cortex. And, 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 and you know, there's, a, there's a lot more dynamics here that uh, we're just beginning to understand. But th that's the story. What about babies? Um, th those same babies, were they also woken up? Did you continue? Were the, the same types of recordings continued? And could you see traveling waves in the waking brain? Yes. OK, so, the, 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 so we, you know, babies have to spend half their time sleeping. So, so we, we uh, were able to collect a lot of data. But, they, but the April only studies them when they're awake. And why is she studying them? So here's a really beautiful story. So uh, a lot of children have uh, problems with uh, late language, where they don't start talking until much later than 
the average child. And also, uh, often they have learning disabilities. So what April has discovered is that if you look at the EEG pattern, that she can predict which children are going to have problems with language and learning at already six months. And it's the power in the gamma band, the 30 to 80 hertz. And we, and we actually, we now know that the, that's a, a band where you also have traveling ways. They're not global, they're more local. And so, uh, so there, there you go. There is another example where these, this correlation, so we don't really understand the connection yet, but it's, uh, we know that in humans, uh, where, when it's been studied, that that frequency, uh, uh, the, the, the traveling, with typically it uh, lasts for a few hundred milliseconds. It's kind of a wave packet that trans is, is a traveling wave across the cortex and that it's associated with things like attention and, and memories, like a specific, you know, the, having the cortex recipient to, uh, to being able to hold on to a piece of sensory information that has just come in. So, so it's, you know, there's it's all of this very, right now, uh, uh, you know, it's like a puzzle. You have a couple pieces on the board and you kind of are beginning to understand what's the picture, but we're not quite there yet. Some of it's from the rat, some of it's from the human. And you know the, the rat is not a human, so we do the best we can. And finally, I, I have a comment that could be predicted based on what I work on, namely that some of these waves could be propagating also through basal ganglia structures and other subcortical structures, and that's a whole other aspect of the learning story potentially. Right. So, uh, the, and I, it's another story for uh, AI as well because reinforcement learning. Uh, temporal difference learning, which is uh, w coupled with deep learning, can do amazing things like learn how to play championship level Go. Uh, that, that basal ganglia forms a loop with the cortex. And so if the cortex is projecting down traveling waves, almost certainly the basal ganglia must be uh, participating in some way. And, and you know, how that uh, then couples into the uh, learning uh, how to uh, maximize, uh, make a series of decisions to maximize future reward uh, it could be a big part of the story, right? It could be, in fact, that's more important down in the basal ganglia than it even is in the cortex. It's not a question, it's just a comment. One of the reasons we sleep is during deep sleep, many hormones are released which are needed for repair and recovery. So it's not just to, and also quality of the sleep matters. People may claim that they can go to bed eight, nine hours, as long as they don't reach the deep sleep, quality is not very good and may not, they always feel much more tired than awake. Well, maybe my mother was right. <laughs> but, uh, but you actually bring up something really important which is that uh, it's not looking for the function of sleep. It's like asking, what is the function of blood, right? It has many functions. I mean, once you have a, a, a technology, an a, a infrastructure in place, you can use it for doing many things. And one of the things, uh, Macon uh, Niedergaard, who is a colleague at Rochester, and we've collaborated, uh, has discovered is that during slow wave sleep, the, the, the refreshing sleep that you refer to, the uh, extracellular space expands, and it looks like there's a current then that carries away debris, which is uh, all of the uh, proteins and things, including amyloid, by the way, which is, accumulates uh, for Alzheimer's, and flushes it out of the brain into the CSF. And, and that's maybe another very important function of sleep. And I'm sure there, there are others, too, that uh, we, we don't even know about that uh, might be even more important. Well, you know, it's, it's called deep sleep for a good reason, right? <laughs> so, Wendover, deep sleep, deep learning has been very exciting. Let's thank Terry again. <laughs>